Hello, everybody. Uh, a woman I met in Lapland a few years ago, she had heard about uh, the news of Brexit, the fact that uh, Great Britain was going to leave the European Union. And we talked about this for a while. And then she stared out the window, uh, overlooking these uh, deep um, uh, valleys in uh, northern Scandinavia. And then she turned to me and said, what a strange place this England must be. They have all these politicians there telling people what to do. <laughs> so I want to talk about urbanization and the question whether or not this has been a positive development for humankind. Though we can see immediately that it's true that there are a lot more people living in the city than in the countryside. Uh, cities have become caches of human beings for... I'd say worldwide, at least half, that means almost four or five billion people are now living in cities, and most of them in the big cities. But there is something that I found out about by reading um, old books from the 18th and 19th century about urbanization, especially in Europe, northwestern Europe. And in those days, uh, there was a lot of criticism about urbanization. Uh, the scholars, professors, thinkers, uh, researchers looking into the matter of big cities, they all came to the same conclusion that these places were uh, breeding places for degeneracy, and uh, filth and disease, uh, mental health problems, and there was simply nothing positive about it. Uh, one thing that really shocked me is uh, a book by a German professor, Professor Hans Günther, who wrote a book about the urbanization, or in German, the Verstädterung. And in this book, the professor claims, based on other sources, that uh, if you track all the rural lineages that migrate into the big city, so you're living on a countryside and you send yourself or your children to, the, to live in the city, uh, he tracked these lineages, these urban lineages, through time. So uh, people arrive to the city, the first generation, they have children in the city, second generation, then there's a third and a fourth generation. And according to the research of Hans Günther, uh, by the fifth generation, all male lineages that had moved to the city had died out. All of them. Most of them already by the third generation. Meaning to say that at some point in time, uh, descendants of migrants who came to the city will cease having children. In fact, we can kind of see that happening in our time, can't we? Uh, if we look at the uh, LGB, you know, that movement, that colorful rainbow movement, they're not having children and it's exploding. I mean, the movement is exploding. They say now 20% of people living in big cities are basically members of this movement. So you can see where uh, Professor Hans Günther was going. He meant to say that after the, by the fifth generation, these lineages have become infertile. They stop having children. Maybe it's because of poverty. Maybe it's because of uh, degeneracy. Maybe it's psychological. But whatever the reasons are, they end. And he was able to determine this fact by tracing male lineages, meaning their last names. Uh, if you have rare last names and you notice that they at some point no longer show up in the archives, in the genealogy, they die out. And what about the women? So Hans Günther investigated this matter as well and said, well, women marry into the men's family. And in, especially in the old days, 18th, 19th century, early 20th century, women, when they got married, they would take the husband's last name. And then it's a bit more difficult to trace the female lineages. But then he reasons, well, wait a minute. Since the women marry into the male lineages, taking on their last name, and those last names, the male last names, die out, the conclusion is that therefore female lineages also die out, meaning that all people who send their children to the city hoping that one day they'll have offspring living in New York in the year 3000, they're all mistaken. All urban lineages eventually die out. Now there's a painting by, uh, I believe he's based in California, Los Angeles, or San Francisco area, you know, the, that area, uh, uh, West Coast, USA, by an uh, artist named Michael Kerbau, or Kerbo, I don't know exactly how to pronounce the name, but I'll show you a painting that he made. It shows you um, basically a city with a giant hole in the center. 
an overcrowded city with a giant hole in the center. And that's, that's what I had to think of when I was reading this book by Professor Hans Günther, namely that cities are both, they're population machines in a sense that they can house a lot of people. And in principle, they could produce a lot of people if people were having children, but this is what they're not doing. People in the countryside are having larger families and they have to send their surplus children elsewhere to war or to die or to the city. So rural peoples are by no means innocent. It is them, of course, who have traditionally been sending their children, their offspring to the city. Now, why would you do that? If you are a, a rural family, rural lineage, why would you send your children away? Well, the answer is, if you have a farm, you can only pass the farm on to one person, to one child. In a patriarchal system, such as in Northern Europe or Europe in general, um, the oldest son, the oldest male child would inherit the farm. There is another opportunity though for the oldest daughter, the oldest female child could then marry into another farm. So someone else had also inherited the farm, the oldest male child, and then uh, the daughter of one family could marry that male from the other family. So there was always room for two people. For every rural family, the oldest son and the oldest daughter would land a farm. The son would inherit the one his parents' farm and the daughter would marry into another farm. So that's two people. But then child number three and four and five and six and seven, what are they supposed to do? There's no farm for them. They're not going to inherit the farm. They can't marry into a farm. Or maybe if they cheat a little, if they're, you know, if the younger daughter is more beautiful than the older sister, maybe she will, uh, you know, marry into that. And for this reason, there were there was this almost a religious morality that if you married someone, you had to marry the oldest daughter first, right? Because it was considered uh, offensive to marry a younger daughter, even for her looks, uh, for the reasons I just explained. So rural families, because they're so healthy, they have access to food and water and clean air. They can have a lot of children, especially if there's nothing else to do. There isn't much, that much to do. Uh, the, the Mennonites and um, other sort of religious sects that move around the world, they live very primitive lives, but they have a lot of children because they don't watch TV, they don't listen to the radio. What else are you supposed to do in our modern time? Well, you have a bunch of kids. I feel like I want to tell you a little bit more about how it all came to be so. From my limited understanding, uh, the idea of urbanization began in the Middle East around five to six, seven thousand years ago, or perhaps a bit earlier in an area called Gubleki Tepe in present day Turkey. Either way, uh, it's, it's the, the area around the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, Mesopotamia, ancient Mesopotamia, and areas adjacent to this area uh, earlier than that. For some reason, urbanization starts there, in the Middle East. And I think the reason is that the Middle East is a crossroads for any people, migrant or otherwise, moving through uh, Africa, Asia, and Europe. These three big continents come together in the Middle East. So anybody going anywhere from one place to another passes through the Middle East. So you have this hotspot of, first of all, a lot of people, a uh, great need for food and services, places to sleep, uh, early hotels, not, not that modern kind, but you understand the point. People uh, passing through had to have a place to sleep. There would have been trade routes there. Everything came together there. So this is where you set up shop, a permanent business, for example, for a trading outpost. And the trading outpost, such as Palmyra, a city that was founded almost 5,000 years ago, becomes this multicultural hotspot. It attracts people who settle there permanently to serve as all the travelers in the area. So the idea of cities starts there. But then at, in th at that point in time, 5,000 years ago, there were practically no cities in Europe and certainly none in Northern Europe. Although the Celtic people started building cities long before the Germanic peoples did. And the Germanic peoples, when they first arrived about 5,000 years ago, they in fact sacked some of the Celtic cities. For example, the German city of Una was probably the old Celtic city of Alizona, and uh, the Germans uh, drove the Celtic peoples out of those areas and took over their settlements. But the Germans themselves never built cities until very, very late. 
In fact, if you look at the city of Rome, uh, around the time of Julius Caesar, the well-known conqueror and emperor, when he was alive, he was living in a Rome with almost one million inhabitants, or a bit over a million. That was in the year 50 BC before Christ. The city of Berlin, however, the German capital, didn't achieve one million inhabitants until the year 1860 or 1890 or so, which is almost 1900, almost 2000 years after Rome accomplished this feat. The urbanization in the northern parts of the world, therefore, uh, started very slowly and it started at the same time as the industrial age also started here. Early cities, of course, especially the ones built thousands of years ago in those days, it meant what did, what did life in a city really mean? It meant you were living in a sort of uh, concrete or a stone cubicle uh, where you did everything. You cooked there, uh, you didn't have running water, you didn't have sanitation. Basically, cities were very primitive cesspools compared to life in the wild. If you were living in wild nature, meaning as a nomad, you would have had some kind of shelter that you would bring along. If you had horses or other kind of cattle that can carry things for you, you would bring your own tent, for example, to protect you against rain and the excesses of cold, for example. But life in the outdoor, in the fresh air, always moving around, certainly was mentally and physically healthier than living in one of these early cities. Uh, even in Europe, by the 18th, 19th century, uh, the working classes were living under destitute conditions, absolutely uh, sickening cities with, without proper sanitation, lots of disease spreading. See, out in, the, out in the countryside, someone catches a strange disease, it's hard to pass it on to others if there are not that many people around. But if you're living in the city and there's an outbreak of typhus, your whole block has it the next day. So as a, if you look at the world as a philosopher, a lover of wisdom, you want to figure out what is really this distinction between life in the countryside, life in nature, or, and life in the city. Uh, a city is all about enclosures. You are literally living within walls. Even when you're outside in the narrow streets in Utrecht or Amsterdam or London or Paris, uh, you're always walking between walls. There's walls everywhere. You lose the connection to the horizon. You can hardly see the sun go down. Cities in general, especially inner cities, where the streets are narrow, they give you this, this intense claustrophobic sense. Even if you're not claustrophobic, it means uh, you are always trapped in this concrete maze where you have to find your way. Another thing that I've noticed is that cities are now, modern cities are about sterility. This is required in cities to keep streets clean and to keep, keep your, uh, your quarters very clean and tidy in order to prevent the spread of disease, which wouldn't be so necessary if you were living in the wild, where the wind takes care of blowing away most diseases. But in cities, there's a lot of, uh, a very high concentration of trash, stuff people uh, throw away, and also human fluids, people are spitting and sneezing, coughing, and so on. Uh, all of this is highly concentrated in cities, which has as a downside that it can make you sick. So cities have to become extremely sterile, much more sterile than the natural world. Human beings who grow up in the cities and spend most of their time in cities never get in touch with the positive biotics uh, that you get from nature, say microbes and bacteria that are beneficial to you, um, knowing that uh, your gut, your belly, carries almost all of the bacteria and microbes with you that you need in order, to, for example, to digest food. But the bacteria in your gut also help to keep other diseases out. Say, there's, so there's the bad bacteria and the bad microbes, and the good ones, you keep the good ones in your gut and help you digest food and, and help you combat diseases from the outside. But if you grow up in a city, you never absorb those bacteria and microbes in the first place because you you're not born with them. You get them from your contact with nature. It's the reason why uh, small children, little babies, when they crawl around the floor, they put stuff in their mouth. They put it in their mouth, not just 
to sense it and to feel it, but it is uh, one way for a child to acquire the bacteria and the microbes that you're going to need for the rest of your life, for your adult life, to, to have a good gut. So cities don't have, city people don't have to solve this problem. Uh, if they're not getting the right microbes and bacteria to keep them healthy, they're going to need something else. They're going to have to take... Can't talk about that uh, on YouTube. They'll deplatform me if I talk about the, them, those uh, the shots. The urban sterility is a problem to human health. And then, of course, there is a, a whole host of psychological problems with living in the city. Um, one thing I've noticed is if you are living in a big city, you are always around people, but they never talk to you. They never look at you. They never care to inquire themselves after you. This is very different. For example, in the Dutch countryside, if you meet somebody, you will say hi. You always greet them. And most of the people here in the Netherlands, they will wave at you and say hi or hello or morn or whatever they say, depending on the dialect. And that's interesting because city intellectuals have made us all believe that country folk are xenophobic and racist, or at least more so than the urban people. When in reality, at least in the Netherlands and Germany and other places I've seen in Europe, country folk always greet strangers. They greet all the strangers. In fact, it is when rural people visit a city like Amsterdam, all of a sudden they discover no one greets them. And when you do say hi to the people you meet in the city, like in Amsterdam, they don't say hi back to you. They don't, say, they don't return the greeting. They're like zombies walking past you. You can't say much to them. You can't greet them. They don't notice you there. Um, this is a very strange experience for someone who isn't from the city. In cities, of course, you make friends by forming cliques. You have a clique, uh, certain uh, hobbies, or you have certain uh, activities or a club life, and you meet your friends at those places. So if you find yourself basically afloat in a sea of strangers who never greet you, and it's very hard to con connect with people in the city, I suppose that is also the reason why so many people living in cities are using Tinder or other social media apps to try to have some friends, uh, virtual friends, because it's very hard to make friends in the city. It's much easier to make friends in the countryside because if you see the same people every day, eventually you're going to talk to each other and you're going to be friends with each other or not. And I will also often wonder why people even put up with city life. I suppose it's convenient. Everything is nearby. But from an evolutionary perspective, it is very strange for people to live in cities at all. Urbanization, though, which started in the Middle East, does explain that there is a peculiar difference between the Middle Eastern peoples, Semitic peoples and other peoples, and the Europeans, especially Northern Europeans, since Northern Europeans haven't begun living in cities until uh, just two or three hundred years ago. Uh, Middle Eastern peoples have traditionally been living in cities for thousands of years, and it does change you if you have to... If you spend 5,000 years looking for a mate in a city versus 5,000 years for looking for a mate in the countryside, your behaviors change. The sort of mates you find are different. They're genetically different. What I mean to say is that people who are descendants of long lineages of urban dwellers are genetically different from people who are descendants of long lineages of uh, rural uh, peoples. In fact, uh, I myself am the first of my entire lineage to spend so much time living in big cities. My parents were born on farms. Their parents lived and died on farms. They never even went to cities. Uh, and before that, if you go further back, we were hunters and gatherers. We were simply never the urban dwellers. So by the time that uh, Semitic peoples in the Middle East are living in cities and they have theaters and they have you know, these open theaters like the Romans had. They had that in Palmyra 5,000 years ago. Uh, they have a whole system. They had notaries, they had lawyers, they had courts. <clears throat> All of these things that we now call modern uh, were invented in the cities of the, the Middle East of the ancient Mesopotamia thousands of years ago that only arrived to Europe Recently, so you can understand that for many rural Europeans, especially Northern Europeans, whose urbanization began so recent, uh, all these things um, put us on a lower level in the, in the urban social hierarchy. In other words, modern day 
white people still don't like cities. They're too crowded, they're too loud, there are too many people, too many people who don't care about us, too many people we don't care about, and we're not sure what to do with that. I think a lot of people from Europe, if I would suggest you the following, say you are living in a city today, in a small um, studio, 20 square feet or something, really small or a bit bigger, if I told you you could have a mansion in the countryside with some horses, uh, everything is arranged for you, you can have a wife there and you can have seven kids, would you? Would you move? Or would you stay in the city and have at most one or two kids or no kids at all uh, and basically have your mind indoctrinated by media, propaganda, the news, and the school system all day, every day? What do you want? <laughs> A lot of people, uh, if you present them these two options, as in you could move to a big mansion in the countryside and have a good family there, a lot of people from the city would say yes to that. They would, they would want to leave. If we look ahead, uh, there's this book by a descendant of Charles Darwin, who's also called Charles Darwin. And he wrote a book called uh, The Next Million Years, in which he looks ahead. And he mentions in this book, there's a paragraph where he writes that, uh, someday in the future, all rural peoples will be uprooted from the countryside and moved into the city, and there will be no more people living outside of the cities. Basically, the entire world could transform into a big giant city. Uh, imagine every inhabitable spot on Earth turned into a, into a Hong Kong skyscraper, if you will. That, to me, would be the worst nightmare. To me, having lived in cities, my conclusion is that they're the end of people. Cities are the end of people. I don't think this is healthy for people, but the problem is, like I said, people, longer urban lineages have evolved to life in a city. That means they are benefiting more from life in the city than people who have not been living in cities for so long, for genetic reasons and for psychological reasons. It changes your psyche. For example, people who are uh, basically descendants of urban homo sapiens, urbanensis, urban man, they look at other people um, uh, in ways of how to exploit them. Whereas rural peoples arriving to the city for the first time in their life, they look at other people as ways to, what can I offer those people? And there you go. The people, the newcomers offering their goodwill, so to speak, they're the first to lose everything because the people who are trained in city life know that you survive in the city, you progress personally, financially in the city by exploiting other people, which is one reason why urban socialists always favor mass immigration, more people to exploit. Uh, it's also why conservative people living in the countryside don't like mass immigration, meaning because mass immigration to a small town means the small town stops being small and that way of life then disappears. And here I think lies the greatest rift between people, far greater than between, say, white or black people, between the races or between religion. It is, in fact, uh, the actual genetic difference between uh, urban lineages of people and rural lineages of people. These two are irreconcilable. Either one or the other wins the world. Either the whole world becomes a city, destroying the countryside, destroying basically domesticating all humans, uh, there will be no more free humans or free-range humans, as I call them, or uh, undomesticated humans, or the rural peoples figure out a way to destroy the cities. And I think that's not impossible. You could look at the pipelines, oil gas lines, oil and gas lines, and um, other sorts of uh, electricity wires that move into the city, the roads, the highways that move into the city, the railroads, the waterways that move into the city. These could be sabotaged, and I think quite easily, with a small number of men, you could basically kill global urban civilization. And the question is, when?